Hello, hello everyone. To, welcome to Ember. Um, I'm Bryony Worthington and I'm um, on the board of, of this newly badged or uh, rebranded think tank. We're based in, in the UK and we're formerly uh, the Sandbag Climate Campaign. And uh, I'm delighted to be introducing uh, today's webinar, which is uh, to run us through the new Global Electricity Report that Ember have published this morning. And it's already had some coverage, so we're delighted to see that. So I'm going to kick off with just a few minutes on, a couple of minutes on uh, how the webinar is going to run and some housekeeping points, and then I'm going to hand over to the team. Um, I suppose the first uh, thing to say is that we're very encouraging of questions. So if people have used Zoom before, they'll know that there's a Q&A function at the bottom that you can uh, table your questions. And we'll, we'll have at least half an hour after the presentations to answer your questions. So please do use that Q&A function. Um, the other thing to, to, to mention is that the, um, the website, ember-climate.org, now has all the data on it um, that the report is based on. And it's got a wonderful portal that you can um, choose your country and it will select the data relevant to your country and you can download that if you want or take the whole global data set and, and play with that. So um, please do visit the website and have a look at that and of course read the report. So I wanted to just say a few words about um, why uh, this report and, and, the, and the sort of evolution of this. Um, Sandbag has been for the last six years producing a really in-depth assessment of electricity and, uh, and the sources of electricity in, in Europe and the associated CO2 emissions from that. And this is the first time that a global electricity report has been compiled and it's drawing from a range of different um, publicly available data sets and synthesizing them. And it is the first, we believe, the first global assessment of electricity demand and, and supply um, to be made public. And um, we're making all the data underpinning it public. And our real aim in doing this is to produce unbiased and authoritative analysis of that data, but also to make that data fully accessible. There are other um, reports, global reports on energy demand and supply and indeed the electricity market, but they're either um, a little delayed or behind a paywall or they don't make the data available or they come from sources which perhaps you might think of as having a particular lens on the data. So this is the first global, independent, fully accessible uh, report on what's going on in the electricity sector and um, it covers the year 2019. So very, very recent data. So that's really all I wanted to say. Um, there is uh, now going to be a presentation from the lead author of this report, which is Dave Jones, who's been working tirelessly to get this all ready. And then you and Graham will follow up with some uh, further notes about the actual methodologies used and the data, and then we'll open it up to questions. So hopefully um, we'll, we'll have a good hour long discussion and um, we'll leave knowing a lot more about what happened last year in terms of electricity than we do now. So over to you, Dave, and look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brownie. Um, hopefully you can see the slides up. Uh, Phil's got the uh, in charge of the little pointer here. So um, I want to start off by running through um, the four key findings um, before I hand over to you and um, to talk about where we got the data from um, and the methodology. So um, uh, on the next slide, we'll see um, the four key findings that we want to talk about. Um, number one, um, global coal-fired electricity generation fell by 3% last year in 2019, and that led to a 2% fall in um, CO2 power sector emissions. Um, falling coal generation is not yet the new normal and that means limiting um, climate change to 1.5 degrees is looking extremely difficult. The third key finding we'll cover is around uh, wind and solar generation which rose by 15% in 2019 and generated 8% of the world's electricity. Um, and then the final bit we'll cover is around the US coal collapse um, which is being undermined by a switch to gas. Um, and just compare that against the, the, the EU coal collapse, um, where uh, the big leapfrogging effect from um, coal direct to wind and solar without um, going via uh, uh, that second fossil fuel of gas. Cool. OK, so let's start off with our first key finding. Um, what happened in the global electricity sector in 2019? Um, if we look at that first left graph, um, the bars are in terawatt hours, and you can see the percentages on for each fuel. Um, you can see that coal fire generation dropped by 3% in 2019. Gas fire generation rose by 4%. Um, a large part of that rise was due to coal gas switching in the US and the EU, 
Um, but there's a lot of other countries that have increased their reliance on fossil gas generation in 2019 as well. Uh, China gas generation rose by 11%, but from a, a relative small base. Um, and three other countries increased their gas generation by the, the same volume, and that's Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Mexico. Wind generation increased by 12%. Um, a third of that increase was from Northwest Europe, where now offshore installations um, have started coming online um, in the UK, in Germany, in Denmark, and in Belgium in 2019. Uh, solar generation, uh, that increased by 22%, is fast catching up with wind generation as a main source of uh, new fossil free generation. Um, the EU doubled the amount of solar generation uh, installed in 2019 and also Vietnam, Japan and Australia had strong increases in 2019. Um, hydro generation increased, um, increased in China and India and most of that was down to rain rather than new installations. Uh, India had its biggest monsoon year in 30 years. Um, and China did install um, some hydro capacity, four gigawatts, but that was a quarter of what it was installing on average last decade. Uh, nuclear generation rose, it rose by the fastest uh, this century, and that was, uh, that was following restarts of old nuclear plants in South Korea and Japan, um, with some new plants coming on uh, in China as well. Um, the orange bar is probably the most important. That talks about the electricity demand um, and shows that electricity demand rose by 1.4% in, in 2019. And that was the lowest growth rate in a decade. Um, in part, that was low economic growth. And it was also due to a, a mild winter in the US and the EU as well. And the final part is CO2 emissions. Um, uh, and they relate to the fossil fuel um, bars on the left-hand side of coal and gas in the first two bars. Uh, and you can see that the global power sector, CO2 emissions fell by 2%, and that was obviously caused by the 3% fall in coal generation. Um, and this fall in CO2 takes into account the rise in gas generation, but it doesn't take into account the, uh, the climate impact of the methane leaks from the extra gas generation um, uh, coming from it. Um, it does include a fall in the oil generation, which fell during 2019, and it includes a small improvement in China's coal fleet efficiency, although um, that, that improvement in China's coal fleet efficiency was the lowest uh, since the official reporting began back in 2006. On the next chart, you can see the annual changes in the power sector emissions and in coal generation going back to 1990, when the IEA first started reporting. And you can see what happened in 2019 um, was the lowest um, was a or biggest falls um, since at least 1990s, passing even what happened during the 2009 recession. So the second slide, the next slide, uh, I want to show you where those falls in coal generation were and why. Um, you can see for simplicity, we've grouped together wind and solar, we've grouped uh, hydro and nuclear, and then the total of all these bars together is obviously the change in electricity demand for, for the country. And you can see most of the fall in coal in that red bar took place in the US and the EU. Uh, coal generation collapsed by 24% in the EU and by 16% in the US. Um, and the reasons were, were similar, um, new wind and solar, solar installations, uh, more gas generation. And you can also see the bars add up to be slightly uh, negative because electricity demand um, actually fell slightly um, in, in both the EU and the US. Um, I'm going to talk a lot more about that coal collapse in the US and the EU in the, in the last key findings. Um, next up is uh, Incredible India. Who would have thought that uh, uh, in India uh, we'll be recording its uh, first ever fall in coal generation as soon as uh, 2020? Um, there was a lot of one-offs uh, involved in that fall. Uh, record hydro generation from the monsoon to pick up in nuclear availability and uh, uh, very importantly a slowdown in the electricity demand growth because of the economic slowdown. Um, but structurally wind and solar increased and India plans to build a lot more of it. So that means that although 2019's falling coal generation in India was unique circumstances, uh, falling coal generation might even become a bit more of a regular feature, uh, hopefully in the next five to 10 years. Uh, next up is South Korea and Japan, and they had a very similar 2019. Nuclear restarts um, took place alongside a pickup in wind and especially in solar generation. Um, and that led not only to a fall in coal generation, but even to a fall in uh, gas generation as well. Um, uh, a big up to uh, Australia, uh, they had a 54% increase in solar generation um, in 2019 and that took a, took a chunk out of coal generation, um, uh, basically uh, one for one offset in the, in the terawatt hours of coal generation in, in Austria from that solar increase. 
Um, and then we're into the countries on the right hand side with the increasing coal generation. Um, if you put them on a map, uh, you'll see a pattern, uh, Asia, 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 Asia and Asia. Um, Malaysia, Philippines and Indonesia all tell a very similar story. There was higher electricity demand um, um, and that's only being met with coal because very little investment is going into fossil free generation. Um, this can't be the way forward. Um, Vietnam got a little unlucky um, with the blips in 2019, but underlying all of that actually installed a huge amount of solar capacity um, and hopefully that, that will reduce its need for, uh, for coal growth in the future. Uh, and China, then there's China. Um, the most uh, amazing thing about China is the size of the overall bar. Uh, electricity demand continued to soar, um, increased by 5% in 2019, which is three times um, the global average. And electricity demand per capita is now 50% above the global average. Um, and exceeds that of the UK, um, although it uh, still remains uh, less than half of what uh, there is in the US. Um, so there's no shortage of fossil free generation investment in China, wind, solar, nuclear, hydro generation all rose, but they can't keep pace with that increase in China's electricity demand growth. Um, still coal and fossil gas generation had to increase to meet that growth in electricity demand. Um, and that, that led to a 2% rise in coal generation. And that means for the first time in 2019, China was responsible for, for over half of the world's coal, global coal generation. Um, and in fact, since 2015, when the Climate Paris Agreement was signed, China's coal generation has risen by 17%, whereas total coal generation in the rest of the world has fallen by 9%. Um, so our second key finding um, is um, that falling coal generation is not yet the new normal. And, and I want to return back to that first chart that we were talking about to try to illustrate that. And out of the four key reasons for falling coal generation, only one of them, the increased wind and solar generation, is a structural factor. Um, the biggest factor was that electricity demand increased um, by the least in a decade. Um, had electricity demand increased at the average of the last decade last year, um, then global coal generation would most likely not have fallen. Um, and next up is um, the coal gas switching as a reason for the, the fall in coal. Um, and within the EU at least, um, there was a big switch in prices from coal to gas so that gas was the cheapest fuel to dispatch. Um, and since the EU is building very little new gas generation, this falling coal from the, the gas switch, um, that was also a bit of a one-off. Third, the big increase in nuclear generation was mostly due to restarts of older nuclear plant in South Korea and Japan. And likewise, the increases in hydro were one-off, as we said, from China and, uh, and in India, uh, uh, heavy rains. Um, so only wind and solar generation we know will be increasing year on year. And in the long term, hopefully, wind and solar with some help from hydro and nuclear will be able to scale up to meet not only that increase in electricity demand, which it isn't doing at the moment, but even to go beyond that to aggressively reduce coal generation. Um, and for, you, for those that know me, um, uh, I'm normally I'm, I'm a half glass full person. So I'd love to say we're already in a world of falling coal generation. Um, but that's simply not true, uh, at, least, at least so far. So on the next slide, um, I just want to kind of highlight the, the challenge of reaching 1.5 degrees um, in context of coal. So the IPC's um, 1.5 degrees median scenario, which is that yellow line, orange line, um, shows coal generation must collapse by three quarters by 2030. That means 11% fall every year uh, starting now. Um, the IEA sustainable development scenario is less extreme. Um, their scenario assumes more warming than 1.5 degrees and includes a lot of negative emissions in the future. And despite that, they still say global coal generation must halve by 2030, which means year on year reductions of, uh, of over 4%. Um, are we on target to achieve these falls? Um, well, the table on the right shows the top 10 coal countries. and. 87% of the world's coal generation is from these top 10 countries um, and none of those countries have yet made a commitment to reduce coal uh, to a level that would be consistent with the IEA's sustainable development scenario, let alone that tougher IPCC 1.5 degree scenario. Um, only one of these countries so far has set a coal phase out date, which is Germany, and that's only 2038 and that's not consistent with a one and a half degree pathway. So this lack of urgency on coal means climate, limiting climate change to 1.5 degrees is looking increasingly uh, difficult. 
The third key finding, I'm slightly happier notes, um, is about all the great news coming from wind and solar. So wind and solar um, generation rose by 15% in 2019. Um, Phil, can you just uh, forward the slide? Um, and, um, and you can see that rise of, there's a rise of 270 terawatt hours and that was the second biggest um, rise on record. Um, but the growth rate is slowing. That 15% growth rate was the lowest um, so far this century. And on the left-hand side, you can see to reach um, uh, either, either the one and a half degrees or the IEA sustainable development scenario, wind and solar generation need that compound growth year on year on year of around about 15%. Um, so that global wind and solar generation almost quadruples in just the next 10 years. Um, that 15% was achieved in 2019 and, uh, and lower, power, lower prices for wind and solar hope that, uh, give hope that it be, can be uh, sustained. Um, but the growth rate has been slowing dramatically and maintaining that growth rate as the, as the volumes pick up and scale up will get harder and harder. The first of the graphs on the right hand side shows that wind and solar generated over 8% of the world's electricity in 2019 and that's up from only uh, three percent in 2013 and um, that's one heck of achieve, an achievement um, and one of the reasons that so many co um, countries are investing and one of the reasons is that so many countries are investing so heavily into wind and solar you can see that China now gets almost nine percent of its electricity from wind and solar the US ten percent the EU are whopping 18 percent and India at eight percent um, and in fact, it's in the rest of the world where some of those laggards are hidden. So South Korea generated only 3% uh, from wind and solar, the Philippines 2%, 1% in Ukraine, Taiwan, Kazakhstan and Malaysia. And there are some countries that have almost zero wind or solar generation. So in Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Indonesia and Iraq, and um, still, despite still having good uh, wind and solar resources. Um, record wind and solar prices in 2019 should give some kind of hope that these compound growth rates can be sustained. Um, uh, the, the lowest solar price recorded in 2019 was in Portugal, where a French developer, Arco, uh, won a project with a $16 a megawatt hour price. Um, and wind prices were established in Brazil with uh, prices of just uh, $21 per megawatt hour. So maintaining that 15% compound growth year on year is possible, but it's going to require a huge concerted effort from, uh, from all regions. Um, so going on to the final key finding, um, I just want to talk about the coal collapse in the US and the EU. And I want to kind of step back from the 2019 picture and just have a little bit more uh, the, the trends that's going on at the moment. And you can see from since 2007, coal generation has halved in both the EU and in the, in the US. Um, in the US, coal and that, on that red bar on the, on the left graph, um, you can see it's been replaced 35% with wind and solar, um, which is a green bar. Um, and then 65% um, of the coal has been replaced with extra gas generation, which is the purple. Um, you then look at the, the bars below that for the EU and you can see the coal generations are also halved since 2007, but there's been a one for one replacement um, w uh, of coal with wind and solar. Um, gas generation, I said, is unchanged. It's actually fallen slightly over that period. Um, and in fact, in 2019, um, uh, um, uh, wind and solar generation in the EU actually um, was bigger than coal generation um, for the first time, which is, um, which is a huge achievement for uh, phasing out coal in Europe. And what we wanted to do with this, with this was to highlight some of the impacts from a CO2 perspective. So in the US, total power sector emissions fell by 33% over this time. Um, but when you include the methane leaks in there, that fall um, in greenhouse gas emissions could be as low as 19%. Um, and then when you look at the CO2 emissions for the EU, um, they've fallen by a much faster 43%. Um, and and what, I guess the point of this was really to say there's no time to waste by substituting one fossil fuel um, for another. So they're the four key findings that we just wanted to present to you in a little bit of detail. Um, I, uh, um, please do ask lots of questions in the q and A. It'd be great to have a discussion after this. Um, the hardest bit of all this project wasn't the analysis that I did, but it was creating the global data set, which you and, um, and the rest of the data team have been spending uh, working full time on for six months now. 
Um, so let me hand over to you and um, to explain what he did. Um, um, it'd be great to listen carefully. I'd love for you all to understand the data so you're able to confidently use it in your own analysis. Um, and I hope you see it as a valuable data set. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dave. Um, so yeah, I think I'd like to start by outlining the main challenge faced in collating all of this data, um, which is that timely data on countries' electricity generation can often be very hard to come by. So as an example, uh, I've got a screenshot from Electricity Map, which is a fantastic website that brings together live electricity generation data from around the world so you can access it all in one place. But as you can see, by the, all the gray on this map, there are a fair few gaps. Um, so very few countries outside of the EU publish live generation data. But if you wait long enough, the national data does exist. Um, by February of 2020, there was sufficient national data released to account for over 85% of total generation and close to 95% of coal generation globally. So we can use these national, this national data to form the backbone of our report and it allows us to release it when we have. Um, but I guess a, a good question to ask is who else is collating all this data? Um, and there are two main organizations that currently do other than ourselves. Uh, and the releases of electricity generation data by those organizations do have their flaws. I think Brian sort of touched on this at the start. So the IEA released uh, their Global Energy and CO2 status report in March. Um, however, there's no detailed breakdown by country and it lacks a specific power sector focus. When they do release their country level data, um, it's only released after about one or two years. Uh, it's difficult to download all in one place and it's got a very strict data policy that prevents uh, the further free analysis of it. Secondly, BP, they released their statistical review of world energy in June. However, it's written through the lens of an oil and gas major and as a result, predictably, doesn't focus on the climate change impacts of the power sector developments in that year. So we really felt there was a need from us to bring this data together ourselves. So I'll go on to talk now a bit about the sources we use for our four key regions. So we identified four key regions being China, the EU, US and India for our report. For China, we took data from the China Electricity Council or the CEC, which was released in late January. For the US, we took data from the Energy Information Administration, the EIA, released in late February. From India, we took data from the Central Electricity Authority released in late January. And then finally, for the EU, as I hope some of you already know, we've been producing a European power sector review for six years now. And so we're able to use the data set that we put together for that report um, in this report. So that's mainly Eurostat data with data taken from recent years obtained from ENSOE's transparency platform, as well as a few other national sources. So a few comments uh, on some of the sources. Um, for China, the CEC coal generation data is lower than that quoted by BP or IEA. This is for two main reasons. Um, firstly, it doesn't include electricity generated from waste heat in these coal plants. Um, the IEA and BP uh, estimate this themselves and so come up with a higher number. And it also doesn't include generation by auto producers and off-grid coal plants. Similarly, the CEA data for India also doesn't include generation from auto producers, making their fossil generation data lower than the IEA and BPs who also estimate this. And finally, for the rest of the world, uh, we relied on the EIA's international data browser as a source of historical data which is a fantastic source of uh, free and open data put together by the EIA. And then we used a combination of national data sets and informed estimates to build up a full picture for 2019 generation. So release of national data allowed us to build up a picture for over two thirds of electricity generation from these rest of world countries. And the rest was estimated as follows. Where absolutely no data was available, we assumed that any trends in a country's electricity generation that was seen between 2016 and 2018 would continue into 2019. 
We then sense checked this initial estimate against any available media reports and economic indicators. And finally, using wind and solar capacity estimates, um, we calculated any growth in wind and solar generation that would have been missed by simply continuing historic trends. So there's clearly a need for governments to publish more data on their electricity generation. And I hope that each year we release this report, we'll be able to bring in more and more country data as the electricity transition picks up pace. Dave is now gonna dig into the regional analysis in a bit more detail. Yeah, thanks. I don't really wanna, I guess, spend much time talking about this. I just want you to show you three slides to get a bit of a taster about what we have here. So we've kind of created this big report and we've kind of cut the data two different ways. We've cut it by country um, and we have two double page spreads, um, which you've had to see um, for each of the main regions we pulled out. So for China, for India, for EU, for US, um, and then um, some details for the rest of the world. Um, so Phil, if you go on to the next slide, you see the first um, page about how we've done that. Um, so you can see uh, some of the key messages by region, how that transition should look, um, and then what's been happening in 2019. Um, and then there's a second uh, double page spread on the, the next page after that for each region, which um, gives a whole load of uh, kind of data insights into all of this. And um, and on the, the download section, you've got the dashboard, which uh, Brian mentioned, which is great. Um, um, but you've also got um, uh, the raw data you can download and also the graph data. So if you want to know, see any of the raw data behind these graphs, you can easily pick it, it up directly. Um, and this slide here is, is I guess, the after the regional analysis, we then cut it back by fuel. So this is then repeating some of the same messages from the, from the, from the regions that we had earlier in the presentation. So on the example of coal generation, you can see the world overview. Um, and then it's split down into each of the regions side by side for China, US, EU, India, rest of the world to give you a bit of an idea and, um, about a specific topic that you might want to uh, pick up, a specific fuel you might be able to pick up. Um, so I just really wanted to end on that to kind of um, kind of whet your appetite a little bit for some of the data analysis that's uh, in the report a little bit. And um, uh, and uh, if you just scroll on to the, the final slide, I just want a, a very, uh, very quick plug for um, our last big report that we did in um, at the end of December. We did um, um, a four year study, uh, sorry, study about the four, last four years of um, coal phase out policy from Europe. And the, the reason why we did that was to try and get as many lessons as possible from what's happened in Europe so far from all those experiences about how to phase out coal. So if you're interested in phasing out coal in your country at all, please, uh, please do take a look at that. Cool, so uh, uh, I'll hand over to Bri for uh, some questions. Thank you to both Dave and Ewan, and um, thanks to the whole team, because it's, been, it's quite, been quite a Herculean effort to um, both pull the data together in such a short order and then to produce such a deep analysis and such a good looking report. So it's very, got some really clear data there and fantastic graphs that are very, um, very understandable. So I find it very interesting. Thank you. Um, we have had, we've got, so please, uh, we have still got, I think, 20 odd participants on, on the line. So please do feel free to use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen to ask questions. We've got one in from Christian Scheibler, and I should just say that this is this whole um, webinar has been recorded, and we'll we'll put up a version of it uh, online so people can forward the links to people who weren't able to join us in person. And we'll also we've all got your email addresses, so if you do ask questions, the team have committed to um, taking a time to answer all of them. So please do feel free to use the Q and A function, and we'll get back to you either now in the time we have remaining or um, by email. So first question, um, uh, Dave, I know one, one aspect of the question that's just come in is about methane, which I know you have looked at uh, from coal. Um, and of course, methane from gas is something you do touch on in the report. Do you want to just talk a little bit about the um, non-CO2 gases from power and um, what, if anything else, needs to be done on that? <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, you might be able to chip in on some of the, the, the gas bits as well, and uh, um, certainly from, from um, EDF's uh, work on it. But um, 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 I mean, we've talked about the methane releases from, um, from gas, from upstream gas. 
Um, one of the things we haven't mentioned, um, which is uh, what uh, Christian talks about in his question is, um, there's also um, not a insignificant amount of methane emissions from upstream coal, especially for hard coal. So um, the IEA released um, um, some data last year in their World Energy Outlook, which showed um, there's as many methane emissions from upstream coal mining um, as there is from um, from uh, transport uh, from uh, tran uh, aviation and sorry aviation and transport combined, um, which is a huge amount and um, and that comes mostly from older coal seams. So older, deeper coal seams like you have, especially in Russia, um, produce some uh, huge amounts of methane leaks, which are equivalent to um, to on average globally about 10% of um, the, the CO2 impact of actually burning the coal in the first place and for many mines can be as high as 30% um, and actually within the EU in itself um, there's more methane being emitted um, uh, from coal mines than there is from uh, gas installations um, which is an incredible stat and um, the, the difference between the two is that on the gas side um, it's very cheap and easy and economic to do something about. It's, it just makes no sense to be releasing all of this. It can be captured and it's got some kind of value to that methane. Um, so everyone focuses on the gas side. On the coal side, it's a lot harder to capture that methane because um, it's um, it released at a low level through uh, coal shafts, um, which means there's a much less of a focus around it. But sure, when we're talking about methane, we shouldn't just be talking about the methane from gas. We should be talking about the methane from coal as well. Um, the other bit I just wanted to mention on um, Christian's question, um, just very quickly, was um, he's talking about renewables policy. Is there any decent, what, like, what's the lessons from renewables policy? And uh, I guess it's the same, like, uh, when you do a report like this, it's um, trying to uh, differentiate what happened in 2019 from the rest of the trends. And, um, and uh, this global transition, it doesn't happen in a year, it doesn't happen in two or three years, it happens over a decade or, or um, uh, much, much longer. Um, and what that means is, is that the renewable policies are not about how do you go on a massive splurge in one year. So, for example, like Vietnam had a massive splurge on solar last year. And uh, I'd love to think that that would be repeated and that would keep going year on year on year. Um, um, time will tell. But I, I guess when we're talking about those policies, it's making sure that there's enough signals that this is a long-term um, proposition, that there's enough framework in there to bring in that wind and solar as cheaply and as consistently uh, year on year as possible. And I think there was a third part to Christian's very excellent question, which was about um, upstream coal supply into the system, which the report doesn't look at. Um, we're looking at downstream or midstream combustion of coal, um, but possibly subject of a, another report, maybe, Dave? What do you think? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we're doing some, some work on that at the moment, so um, there'll certainly be something out later on uh, this year from us. Oh, brilliant. That's good to hear. Mark has uh, asked a question. It's had two votes. Um, so are there any signs of what might happen this year, given that this is a very extraordinary year um, <laughs> and we're coming to the end of the first quarter? Um, any thoughts from the team? It's, uh, it's, it's a dreadful time, doesn't it? It's a minor miracle anyone's on this call at the moment, given, uh, given what's happening with, uh, uh, in the world right now. Maybe everyone's just quarantined and haven't got anything else to do, I don't know. Um, but uh, I guess um, here's one thing, to, I mean, there's, you can speculate as much as you want about how much um, power might, might, might or might not fall through this year. It's hard to tell at this stage. Um, um, because it's hard to know how a uh, coronavirus will um, will progress through the, the coming weeks and months. But um, one thing to pull out, I guess, is um, a really good piece of analysis that, um, that that Glenn Peters has been circulating over the last couple of over the last week, which is around um, previous shocks that have happened and about how quickly emissions have caught back up again. Um, from those previous shocks that have happened over the last few decades. So for me, this isn't, um, the coronavirus isn't about necessarily what happens during 2020 in terms of emissions. Is what, what does that mean for the investment? And when you look at China, for example, you know they're going to go on a massive uh, stimulus spur splurge from this so that they're, um, they try and make up some ground on their economic targets from all of this. And will that stimulus be used um, for uh, for their typical infrastructure projects um, that are using huge amounts of steel, huge amounts of concrete, and um, and, and 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 even worse, building coal power stations, or will that stimulus go into the other side of the equation? So into really stepping up wind and solar deployment, um, 
um, setting up electric vehicle charging points to really roll out electric vehicle um, vehicles across China at an even faster rate than what they're doing already. So for me, that's the that's the biggest question to ask through at the moment. It's is what what how is this uh, coronavirus actually going to uh, impact investment as we go through the next few months? Thank you. Um, we, I, I wonder, um, is it worth just pausing on China for a second there? Because obviously, the, the if and one of the things that's hard with China is the growth in electricity demand. And the thing that you alluded to there, which is their decarbonisation of transport, which they are doing quite effectively compared to other countries, it just boosts demand, right? So, so it implies that they do need to keep pace with their zero emissions generation. And, and it just didn't quite keep pace this year, hence the increased coal burn. Um, and I guess, so that's the, the question is, how fast can they incorporate more of the zero emission stuff? And do we have a sense of what their build rate was last year? Was, is there anything coming online? Do we know the kind of pipeline? So, um, so the, I mean, the, the biggest problem with China is just that that slowdown in in the solar rate. So, um, it was two years ago. Now they had that uh, that amazing growth rate in China of uh, installing fifty gigawatts of solar, um, um, and then last year fell, and then so twenty eighteen fell, and then twenty seventeen uh, twenty nineteen fell again, um, uh, and and it kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier was how do you get that consistency of keep, keep building um, and increasing that um, that that wind and solar investment, and that that solar investment has certainly stepped back from where it's been in the past and. Um, wind isn't taking off uh, hugely at the moment either. So um, there, there's a lot more, more obviously, to, to to think about from that side. Um, I, I think just generally, like um, we look at last year and just about how low um, electricity demand growth was. And, and your point was, was you know, we are going to see electricity demand growth picking up as the economy electrifies um, across the world. So that all that investment that's going to wind and solar that needs to step up even just to account for the electricity um, extra electricity demand, let alone before we start talking about crazy things like 11% year on year falls in coal generation, which we need for one and a half degrees, which is why all of this is such a big challenge. Mm. I mean, I would, you'd expect me to say this, but I was, I was encouraged to see that they were still adding gigawatts of hydro and nuclear, admittedly not perhaps at the high, high levels they've seen in the past, but they do seem to be trying to push ahead on, on all technologies um, to try and, I guess, keep their well, make sure they've got a grid that's capable of balancing, and then they've also got to think about their balance of trade in terms of gas and uh, gas and oil and coal. Yeah, yeah. And, and India have got three nuclear plants coming on in the next two years, so um, so there is some underlying um, kind of build up from 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 hydro and nuclear that will play a role in this. Um, mm -hmm. So the, it's not a hundred percent on wind and solar, but that's where obviously a lot of that growth is going to be. So we just touched on Louise's question here about um, China too, and um, her question is, does China have plans or commitments to reduce coal in the short to medium term? Um, and they do have a coal cap policy and a, and a six, which, which five, I can't remember which five year plan we're going into, but there is a five year plan coming. Do we have any intelligence on what that might contain? Uh, no, not really. Um, so the five year plan comes out next year. Um, uh, and it'll be really interesting to see what they come up with because they do devise obviously their their targets for, for how they um, how they how they think about coal generation going forward. Um, so um, that's why all at the moment with what's happening with the coronavirus and the stimulus package and the five year strategy seems like a little bit of an opportunity to to kind of uh, refocus all of that and um, it'd be very interesting to see whether that happens or whether they just carry on with that status quo of um, of where they've been so far which is for, um, for to not have that urgent focus on on reducing coal generation. Very quickly Louise, um, the China Electricity Council which was the source of our generation data, they um, have suggested a target for the five-year plan for 2030 coal capacity, um, and it's it is not it is not modest in any, in any way. Um, but I can I can I can forward you the document um, if you're interested. So you and just be clear by not modest, you mean uh, they're ambitiously cutting coal or they're being sorry uh, sorry that wasn't clear. I meant they they they're not ambitiously cutting coal. Okay. 
Well, we should just note that the CEC is the thermal, that they are the thermal generators of China, really. That's, that's a particular association of thermal generators, isn't it? So they are, do have tend to want to protect their assets. Um, but there could be, I mean, we've had a, a delegation from the CEC over to the UK where they were really interested in how do you reuse coal assets and turn them into zero emissions. Um, and of course, they're, the risk is they look at DRAX and think, oh, great, we'll just do a bit of biomass and gas. And we were saying, no, that's possibly not the right answer. Um, there are other ways of, um, you know, either using um, other, other sources of high temperature heat, including nuclear, that you could do this faster and still reuse your turbines. But um, anyway, that's a little hobby horse of mine. I won't derail this conversation. So another question uh, has come in from uh, Ryan Wilson about Australia and network capacity constraints. I mean, Australia has been in the news a lot. Um, not a huge electricity generator, but obviously a huge source of, of, uh, of energy for others and, and raw materials for others. Um, how do we know much about the, the, the network capacity in Australia and whether it could go 100% clean? It's not one of the countries we focused on, was it? So it's possibly. Yeah, I'm sorry. I probably can't add uh, had too much to this at the moment. So um, in context of exactly what you're talking about, so it's beyond my uh, <laughs> area. One, one for the email then. Okay. Um, right. We've had the China question. Per Christian. Spertoli, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. It seems obvious that Western governments and investors could make a difference by contributing to increased investments in renewables in countries like India and Vietnam. Um, so that's the first question. I mean, that does seem to be from one of the things I took away from the report was that in the rest of the world category, there, it's a mixed picture, but there is a lot of investment going into wind and solar. And it now must be that the, the countries in the tropics offer some of the best returns on solar, solar capacity. Um, what, what more could Western governments be doing to encourage that? Do we have a view? I mean, if the question specifically around um, to stop new coal in China, there, there's a few things. Um, the most important is by lead by example. And um, uh, within Europe now, you have um, 15 member states that have committed a date to phase out coal by. Um, and um, basically, with the exception of um, Germany and Poland, there's going to be very little coal generation left in the EU. So we're kind of working towards that 2030 coal phase out quite nicely within Europe. And is there any way that actually within Europe we could solidify that a little bit more to put pressure on China? Um, in the US, it's going the same way. Like the um, coal generation is collapsing year on year on year on year. You know, it's going to carry on collapsing. Um, so is there, a, is there a way to be able to kind of, you know, show that both the US and Europe are going to be mostly out of coal by 2030 to really try and shine a light on, on China when it's building those new coal plants? Um, the, um, I mean, their strategy for building more efficient coal plants and replacing them with older coal, coal plants has kind of gone a little bit by the wayside last year so the improvement in the in the coal efficiency of the fleet um, was published by the CEC was the lowest since 2006 and um, uh, they had a, a, a huge amount of capacity that, that ended up being built um, um, and only seven it was about uh, 42 gigawatts if I got that right um, and then only seven gigawatts was retired um, so the levels of new build are far, far, far um, increasing beyond that, the, the levels of retirement that are happening. Um, so that, I guess that would be the main thing around China. The other main thing around China for, in terms of international leverage is um, uh, in September with the China-EU um, trade talks coming up. And um, uh, EU is very keen talking about carbon border adjustments, about what they can do to stop importing carbon intensive products into the EU, which is completely understandable. Um, and at the very least, if you are doing a big trade deal with someone that produces uh, half of the world's coal generation, you know, the very least you can ask is, you know, uh, at least stop building coal power plants, please. Dave, can I, I'm not, I know you're the expert on this, but there, there are two things in this report that give me hope. One is that the carbon intensity of Chinese electricity generation fell, despite the new capacity. And there seem to be signs that, from some of your analysis, that the load factors on coal were be decreasing as they were building more capacity. And that's got to hit their profitability, surely, 
so that um, that's another sign that you know if they're using these plant more flexibly they, they're being kicked off by the zero emissions new class tea that, that that they'll stop they'll stop being as profitable and the carbon intensity in China is falling which we should at least acknowledge as a heavy lift for China and quite good news yeah and on profitability then it comes back to if they're not being profitable then why are they being built in the first place and um, and it comes back to that investment plan and um, and uh, um, you did probably seen um, last, last week um, the Chinese authorities uh, released a state by state um, um, uh, piece on um, on whether coal plant whether to allow the planning of coal plants to go through based on um, the the financial risks from them and and they actually um, scaled that back somewhat that will enable more coal power plants to be built um, uh, from that release so um, so absolutely it should be in, impacting those finances um, uh, for coal power plants but until you actually see it happen um, uh, there's a few steps um, before coal plants actually stop getting built. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Kim, uh, Kim Coetzee, who wants to know more about India, please, as do I. I'm very interested by the India result. It was surprising and, and hopeful in many ways. <laughs> I was uh, definitely pulling up my notes as you were saying that uh, uh, as I saw as I saw the uh, the story. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for the the question. It's a really interesting question, and it's it's just nice that they um, that they kind of got such a, a high level commitment. So um, so um, uh, so Modi has basically promised the prime minister has basically promised to increase the adoption of renewable energy sources. Um, to so that renewable share will rise to 40% um, by 2030. Um, so uh, last year in India, um, coal generation was 72% electricity, um, sorry, 72% of the electricity mix. And it was one of the highest in Asia. So if, like what Bryony says, yes, yeah, so like in China and all these other countries, the coal share is actually, is actually falling. Um, but in India, it's still one of the highest. So at 72%, you've got China at 62%, Indonesia at 59%, Philippines at 49%. So um, India is still one of the highest, but with this commitment, to actually um, increase uh, wind and solar from from the prime minister it's uh, it's very exciting you know that's going to fall through time um, it's just a question about whether um, to what extent what will happen with the absolute level of coal generation so in China um, the electricity demand increased so quickly that although the the, the coal mix was falling still the overall amount of coal generation was rising um, and it's impossible to kind of see what will happen with India at the moment you know that coal will continue to fall through the mix um, that more wind and solar will get built and they have a strong commitment to that which is really exciting um, but it's not possible to say quite what will happen with coal generation what is clear I guess is that we're not going to end up going through that same pattern that happened with China two dec a decade or two decades ago, which is for India to become the next China of, uh, of really, really scaling up the, the coal generation. And, and that's, I guess, the most important takeaway from India is, is that we've managed to avoid that scenario through, um, through, through India really embracing wind and especially solar power. And what, one of the things that underpins that result, that surprise fall in coal, is I think the fact that demand was down, and that's probably linked to some, you know, economic uh, growth. But, but I also wondered, and I don't know how easy it is to answer this, but if solar panels are suddenly becoming available in India in a way that they haven't really in previous decades, then a lot of that might show up as negative demand because there'll be small scale applications going in that I bet the data isn't really across. Do you remember in the UK when we first had our first wave of, of electricity from solar, it often showed up as negative demand until the data statistics caught up. So do you think that's anything, anything in that or anything that could be investigated? Um, I don't know the specific case for India. A lot of the countries, when you're building it on your roof, um, you have to register those panels. And when you register those panels, mostly they're, they are included nowadays in the official statistics. And I, I, I don't know what the case with India is. I, I, I guess that you, you might well be right that in India, maybe um, some of that economic, um, uh, some, so some of that demand, like uh, solar is being lost in the uh, falling uh, electricity demand for sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe one for you and to dig into uh, for our year two report. Um, great. Have we got any further questions? Uh, I know that um, uh, there was a question from from within the team about whether or not we think these, you know, the balance. Oh, and someone else asked this question. Obviously, the report highlights a few one-off 
um, things that have affected the global trend, such as reopening of nukes or, or um, uh, falls in demand. Do we think there's a trend here though? Does it look like carbon intensity is, could be falling? And if therefore demand is not growing too fast, we could be on a, this, this could be sustained. What's our feeling? I mean, it's clear that carbon intensity is falling. It's fallen by 15% last decade. It will continue to fall. Um, so electricity will get cleaner. Um, there's a question about how quickly they are, um, the, the carbon emissions and, and therefore the coal will fall underneath that. Um, and uh, um, you see all the uncertainty in the world at the moment. It's really too hard to say whether, um, whether um, uh, coal generation would rise again. I mean, like every year there's specific factors like open to um, year by year. So even in a year of like falling coal generation, you might still get a year of rising coal generation or this. Have we hit a peak yet? Um, are we on the down bit? It's, it's hard to know. It really is. So um, I'd hope so. Um, but the level of um, investment business needs to step up hugely um, from where we are at the moment uh, on, on wind and solar and, and also um, just that focus on on reducing coal generation from those top 10 countries which we're not seeing so far that that's the that's the critical bit for me it's for each of those countries to have a plan about how they actually reduce their coal generation in line with their one and a half degree pathway yeah thank you very much i suppose one thing just to comment on that policy side that the european coal um reduction this this last year was part was affected by the coal price um the carbon price i should say sorry which saw a return back to some, it saw some cold gas switching, but, but really interestingly, um, it didn't take it above the peak of gas production. So it genuinely, the additional demand was met from, from wind and solar. So it seemed to be the combination of carbon price to keep, keep the coal out relative to gas, but then more importantly, or as importantly, policies that are in now in place to de-risk investment into renewables, um, which has clearly meant that we've got uh, extra clean, clean capacity than, uh, than we had previously. Um, jolly good. Well, I wonder if we should close it there. Um, it's been, I've found it fascinating reading this uh, report and being, uh, thank you for letting me be part of the webinar. Uh, and for, thanks for those great answers to those questions. Any questions we didn't get to? We'll go back through and, uh, and reply by email. And as I say, there'll be a recording of this made available. Well, we probably might, might stimulate more questions. So um, thanks team. I think that's, it's been great. And like, great to see so much coverage that you got today, despite the headline news around oil, oil price collapses and coronavirus, you managed to get some really good coverage. So well done. I look forward to further reports and to the second year of the World Electricity Report from Ember. Um, I think that's all I need to say. Dave, any final words from you? Thank you all for being on the call and turning up. It's a good discussion. Fantastic.